We hugged each other tenderly until the morning alarm rang. Damn, reality was calling. My lover got out of bed and went to his adjoining hotel room to get ready for the day. We always booked two adjoining rooms with an internal door to avoid suspicion. It would be bad if our affair were revealed. I was Dan's executive assistant. We've been working together for over two years now, and we've been lovers for most of that time. In my role, we had to work closely and frequently travel across the country to other offices, meeting with clients and attending industry sales conferences. This gave us many opportunities to be together without arousing suspicion. Yes, I was married, I had a husband at home. Our marriage was rather forced. One day, one thing led to another, and I soon discovered that I was pregnant. When we came out to our parents, it was too late to change anything, and we had to give birth to the child. Alan stayed with me throughout my pregnancy, despite many mean comments from other people. The birth was terrifying, but he was with me the whole time. Finally, we welcomed our beautiful daughter into this world. As we held Lauren in our arms, we knew we couldn't give her to someone else. A few years later, another mistake resulted in Lauren having a sister, whom we named Emma. Alan adored his two daughters, and they were very close. My relationship with them was a little more strained. We quarreled quite often, and at times I was offended by them. I guess I subconsciously blamed them for not having the life I planned for myself. After graduating, I took a job as an executive assistant to the business development manager at Dan Johnson's medical device company. I was 29 then, and he was 38. Dan and I got along very well from the start. We quickly became a formidable professional team. I loved my job, sales were growing, and management was happy and gave me a big salary. I finally felt like I had a real normal life. My job involved quite a bit of late-night travel, sometimes alone, but most often with my boss Dan. It was really exciting to travel to new places around the country to meet clients, close sales deals, and network with senior executives. I had a fantastic experience and loved it. I was away from home about three out of every four weeks. My travel schedule can be anything from one or two nights to a whole week, and sometimes even a weekend. While work and travel were great, it meant I was away from my husband and girls a lot. Alan had to take on most of the parenting responsibilities. Dan and I spent a lot of time together and got to know each other very well. Despite our age difference, he got married around the same time as me and had three younger children. To keep Alan from worrying too much about me traveling with my boss, I lied to him that I mostly traveled alone or with another woman. I also told him that although I worked well professionally with my boss, he was a bit of an asshole and I personally didn't like him. In fact, my boss was great and I was fascinated and very passionate about him. I enjoyed spending time in his company. When traveling together, we had a habit of finding cozy restaurants to have dinner, drinking wine and chatting for hours. One evening, about six months after I started working at the firm, Dan and I received a particularly large order earlier that day. In honor of this event, we ordered a special dinner and a bottle of expensive French champagne. After we sat facing each other, feeling both elated and a little confused from the champagne and delicious dinner, he reached out his hand and placed it on mine. Looking deeply into my eyes, he said, you know, Amy, that I am falling very much in love with you. My heart was beating wildly, and I couldn't say a word. After what seemed like an eternity, but in reality it was probably fifteen seconds before he stood up and extended his hand to me. I hesitated for a moment, then took his hand and stood up. He silently led me to his hotel room. As soon as we were in the room, we tore off each other's clothes and fell on the bed in a passionate outburst. We had sex all night. In the morning we woke up and this time made tender love. I felt like I had died and gone to heaven. Our flight home wasn't until late morning, so we ordered breakfast and lazily lay naked in bed, ate, and then made love again before leaving. On the way home I felt some remorse over my infidelity. Rationalizing this, I thought that I never had the opportunity to spread my wings with other men when I was younger and I was entitled to at least once. Plus, it would be fair to my husband since our sex life 
never really recovered after the difficult early years of our marriage. I realized that I had been so caught up in Dan the night before that I had forgotten to call Emma to wish her a happy birthday. She had just turned 11 and was growing up quickly. Looking at Dan, sitting next to me on the plane, who smiled at me and squeezed my hand, I knew, despite the guilt and wrongness, I was won over. When I returned home, the feeling of guilt came with renewed vigor. Alan was very happy to see me after a week apart, but I shied away from his hugs and kisses. Likewise, later that night, when he wanted to make love, I turned him down, citing fatigue. I was tired, but also very exhausted after my night with Dan. This was the first time I turned down Alan. Back to the present, our romance, which began 18 months ago, continued tirelessly. Over time, I dealt with the guilt and hid my secret from Alan, blocking out some of my emotions when I was at home. I didn't realize how emotionally distant I had become from Alan and our daughters. My thoughts always revolved around Dan and when we could be together again. Lying to cover it up became second nature to me, and I no longer felt as guilty. I fell hopelessly in love with Dan and sometimes thought about leaving Alan and being with him. We sometimes discussed it jokingly, lying naked after sex, but we both understood that this was a big step and would bring a lot of pain, especially to our children. Our company was expanding, so we traveled more often for work. Sometimes, when there were no business trips scheduled during the week, we would take a fake overnight business trip and head to a hotel in the nearest city for the night. We also sometimes went on short vacations together to celebrate our anniversaries and birthdays using the excuse of attending a conference in a remote location. The conference was always conveniently located at a nice beach resort in the distance. We chose places where the conference actually took place so that we would have an alibi. We were extremely cautious at work and developed a strong game hypocrisy, acting very professional when other people were around. We never shirked to meet in secret. We ate lunch at different times came and left work at different times, and so on. We created secret emails outside the company's its system and communicated only through them. We have never met in our city. When we had to socialize at corporate events, it was only in large groups, and we never sat together or interacted alone. I usually called home at the end of the day at a time convenient for me so that I could not be interrupted or surprised. I never told Alan where I was staying, and he never asked. At home, I complained to my husband about my tough boss and about having to travel so often and work so hard. He often asked why I wasn't looking for another job with a nice boss and less travel. I just told him that I was studying and earning too much to quit. At casual corporate events where partners were expected to be present, we were very careful to control our emotions and facial expressions. I introduced my husband to my boss, and he introduced his wife to us. We were always careful to have a short, polite conversation and then move on to interact with other colleagues. After that, we never looked at each other. In general, we carefully hid our tracks. Nobody ever suspected anything. My husband Alan was happy that I was doing well at work, but he was also annoyed that I was away so much and that much of the child rearing fell on his shoulders in addition to his own work as an IT consultant. I still loved my husband, of course although I noticed that we were gradually moving away from each other. He always seemed busy with the girls and his work. I had to admit with remorse that we rarely had sex and our tenderness faded. I made a mental note to try and fix it. We experienced a difficult early start in life. With a lot of effort and teamwork, we were able to complete university degrees, me in it and Amy in commerce, while raising two girls. We didn't mind the difficulties because we loved each other very much. When Amy got her first professional job after graduating about two years ago, she was over the moon, and I was very proud of her. Finally, we were both working professionally, earning good salaries, and were ready to start enjoying a normal life together. I was very supportive of her career at first, but I became more and more unhappy with the long hours and amount of travel her job required. She left home around 7 a.m. and usually did not return until 6 or 7 p.m. She was away on business almost every week for at least one or two nights, sometimes more, 
and sometimes didn't get home until Saturday afternoon. When she was home during the week, she either worked after dinner or just lounged in front of the TV. On Saturdays, she slept until late in the morning, then went shopping. On Sundays, she went to the gym in the morning and then had lunch with her friends. In the evenings, she was usually too tired to go out with me. We didn't spend much time together as a family. She always seemed to be too busy at work to take time off, so the girls and I often took time off without her. I noticed her personality was changing. The loving wife and mother were leaving, replaced by a selfish, often irritable and distant inhabitant of the house and my bed. Our sex life was very average, and in turn, I was always disappointed and annoyed. Every time I tried to bring up this topic, I was immediately rebuffed. She would tell me that it was just my imagination, or that I was tired from work, that she was working hard for us, that our sex life was fine, etc. I was worried about what this might lead to. At the end of her first year, I had to accompany her to the staff Christmas party at the CEO's mansion. I met her boss Dan there for the first time, as well as his wife. We had a polite but brief conversation about nothing, after which he apologized and left to chat. My wife took me to others and started a discussion with other employees. Later, I suddenly thought this was strange. Her boss seemed like a nice enough person, if a little reserved, but not the ogre Amy made him out to be. Dan's wife was very nice. Since Amy was his executive assistant, I thought we would have more than just a polite brief conversation. I also sensed that Amy was a little tense. She had a habit of speaking very quickly when she was nervous, which was a clue. I found it strange that she was nervous around her boss when they worked so closely together. It was unclear. Although I trusted her completely, I put the thought aside to think about later. The following year, I was also very busy as I decided to start my own IT consulting firm. In addition, I actually raised our daughters alone, so I pushed most of my concerns about Amy to the back burner. As for life with Amy, it was a repeat of the previous year. She traveled even more often and became increasingly distant from the three of us. Recently, I began to notice that her attitude towards me was becoming arrogant and contemptuous. She showed me little love or affection, and our sex life was virtually non-existent. Sometimes I received sex at her mercy, but without love or intimacy. It was obvious that our relationship was falling apart. At the end of the year, I attended the staff Christmas party again. Our interaction with her boss was a repeat of the previous meeting. After that, I had a fleeting thought that she was hiding something. For the first time since we met, I had doubts about her. Did she have another man? The thought was almost unbearable. We fought so hard together, overcoming so many challenges, to get to where we were now. She wouldn't do that, would she? What should I do? I didn't go to extreme measures like hiring a private investigator or hacking her computer, but I started watching her more closely. I couldn't notice a single thing out of place. Either it was my imagination, or she was very clever at hiding her tracks. In any case, there was nothing good between us. I guess I was too busy to care. Meanwhile, my girls were growing up rapidly. Lauren, now 15, was growing into a beautiful young woman, and Emma, now 12, was on the cusp of womanhood. We spent a lot of time together and were very close, although unfortunately their mother had little time for them. Both girls were passionate soccer players, so every Saturday morning during the season I would go to watch them both play. It was the highlight of my week. After the game we would go out for lunch, usually their favorite Japanese restaurant, and chat about what they were doing. I noticed that they almost never mentioned their mother. Then, depending on the weather, we walked along the beach, went to the cinema, or met with our friends. After the first match of the season ended, Emma approached me, accompanied by a new member of the soccer team. She was a charming young girl, tall, incredibly beautiful, with a wide smile, long dark hair, and deep dark brown eyes. She was also very athletic and excelled in her first game when Emma's team scored two goals. Hey Dad, it's Callie. Can I go over to her house and hang out this afternoon? Hi Callie, nice to meet you. Of course, Emma, if Callie's parents don't mind. Callie turned and shouted, Mom, Emma can come over this afternoon. 
The woman, obviously Callie's mom, turned and walked toward us. Damn it. She was the grown-up version of her daughter and absolutely stunningly beautiful. She introduced herself as Sophie. She readily agreed that Emma could come to their house in the afternoon. Then we talked a little, but I'm still not sure what I said. I knew I was speaking somewhat incoherently. After they left, my two girls laughed at my embarrassment and then grinned at each other. That evening Emma reported that Sophie was very sweet. She has been a single mother since Callie's father died in a car accident about three years ago. Sophie raised Kelly and her younger brother Tom, who were 11, alone. The single mom moment definitely caught my attention. The following Saturday, while Lauren and I stood watching Emma play soccer, Sophie and her son came up to us and asked if they could watch with us. I prepared myself mentally in case I saw her again and was determined not to look so stupid again. We chatted during the game. She had recently moved to the city for a new job and didn't know many people yet. She was very happy that Callie had found a new friend in Emma and complimented me on her good manners. After the match, Emma asked if Callie could come over. Of course, Emma, that would be great if you don't mind Sophie. I'm sure. Why not come over now, Callie, and have lunch with us? Do you like sushi? Yes, I like it. Great, it's decided. In fact, why don't all three of you come have lunch with us? I blurted out. Thank you very much for the invitation, Alan, but I would disturb your family, so I won't come. I was a little crestfallen when Lauren sang, No, please, Sophie, come, it would be great if you were with us, and for a change I'll find a woman to talk to. You will absolutely not interfere, please. She looked at me. If you're sure I'm not in the way, Alan, that'll be great. I nodded and mumbled something vaguely. As we turned to walk to our cars, Lauren turned to me with a chuckle and a wink. Lunch was a great success. We, mostly four girls, chatted for almost two hours. I think Tom was glad of the other man's company, and we chatted a bit between ourselves about computers and football. At one point I heard Sophie, very casually, ask my daughters if their mother was coming to watch their soccer games. Lauren's answer surprised me. No, never. She's not really interested in us. She's only interested in her job and herself. Dad is our mom, too. He's the one who takes care of us. Sophie gave me a questioning look. During the rest of the football season, it became our habit to have lunch together after every game. Emma and Callie became close friends and alternated visiting each other after games and sometimes after school. Sometimes Tom came with his sister, too, but he seemed to want to spend time with me. We often worked on computers, played ball, or went out on bicycles. I also noticed that Lauren visited Sophie often, and they would sometimes go shopping together and then stop for coffee and talk. I noticed that my daughters never mentioned Sophie to their mother, and neither did I. Sophie and I also became fast friends. Since I was essentially a single parent like her, it made our lives easier by helping each other with raising our children. After the end of the football season, we were increasingly left alone on Saturday afternoons when our children went on their own field trips or visited various friends. I usually didn't have a wife around, so I was mostly free. So, increasingly, Sophie and I spent this time together, walking, having an informal lunch, or watching a movie. I looked forward to our meetings more and more and realized that I was falling in love with her. Despite this, we never crossed the border of friendship. Over coffee with Sophie one day, I told her that I appreciated her spending time with Lauren. You know, she never stops talking about you when she comes home, Sophie this, Sophie that, I laughed. Well, Tom never stops talking about you either after he visits you, Alan this, Alan that, she laughed in response. Seriously, he needs a male figure in his life, so I appreciate you spending time with him. Then she suddenly said, Sorry to be blunt, Alan but it seems pretty obvious that all is not well between you and your wife. We never really discussed Amy trying to avoid the topic. I was silent for about 30 seconds. This was a question that I pushed away for a long time and avoided confronting. The truth is, Sophie, if it weren't for the girls, I probably would have left a long time ago. 
things have really been bad the last few years. I tried to talk to her many times, but I always hit a wall. Our marriage was difficult from the start. I think Lauren told you how Amy and I ended up married. Yes, and she blames herself a little for your situation. I know it's crazy, and I told her it's not her fault at all. This opened the dam for me. I spent the next hour venting all my woes to Sophie. At the end, she came over and hugged me tightly. It was my first real hug from a woman in a long time. I'm here for you when you need me, Alan, you know that. I just hugged her tighter and didn't want to let go. Less than a year later, it was time for Amy's annual work Christmas party again. My experience with her boss was very similar to the previous two years. This time I was on my guard. Although Amy and her boss were acting much more casually than before, something was wrong. I definitely suspected something between them. Later, towards the end of the evening, Amy excused herself and went to the toilet. After a minute, I looked around and noticed that her boss was unobtrusively heading up the stairs. I decided to follow them and went up in search. She wasn't in the closet, so I looked around the huge house and was already near the bedroom door, which was wide open, when I heard my wife's voice inside. Merry Christmas, dear. A man's voice replied, Merry Christmas, my love. I peered through the crack of the door and saw Amy and her boss kissing passionately, their hands all over the place. I quickly retreated in shock. I went back downstairs, wondering what to do. I was more than angry, I felt dead inside. I don't have a temperament, so instead of immediately confronting me, I calmed myself down and decided to investigate and plan first. Amy soon returned, a little flushed, and spent the rest of the evening pretending to be my loving wife. I pretended nothing had happened. By New Year's, while working while Amy slept, I hacked into her phone and laptop. Amy should have known better. Keeping incriminating evidence on your personal computer, even when it was very well hidden, is not very smart when your husband's profession is knowing how to hack computers. My worst fears were confirmed. There was a trail of evidence in her work, personal and secret emails. Amy was in a long-term, tumultuous, and intimate relationship with her boss that began over two years ago. I also found graphic photos and videos of the two showing the depth of her betrayal. I saw from their correspondence that Amy and Dan even discussed leaving their partners to be together. She seemed interested, but her lover was more cautious. I really was a naive, trusting husband. I installed hidden tracking software on her phone and laptop. I could monitor her every electronic and physical move remotely if I wanted. My marriage is clearly over. My main concern now was maintaining custody of my daughters and protecting my business and finances. On New Year's Day, I consulted with a divorce lawyer. She told me that divorces are no fault, so there is no point in suing for adultery. However, in the case of child custody, once the children turned 14, they had the right to decide which parent they wanted to live with after the breakup of the marriage. She also developed a strategy to protect my company from a financial divorce settlement. Emma turned 14 in six months. Until then, I could endure life with Amy, and it gave me time to pull myself together. For this to work, I'll have to keep it a secret from Amy. I told Sophie what I had learned, and she burst into tears. It was a surprise, I thought I should be the one who is the most upset and needs a hug. I held her close for a while, and she began to tell me with tears in her eyes that her husband was killed while he was driving with his secretary. When she looked through his belongings after his death, she discovered that they were having an affair. This made his loss even worse. After she calmed down, we talked some more and I told her about my plans to leave Amy. She simply grinned. To put my plans into motion, I first convinced my wife that since we were both now making good money, we should sell our small house and rent somewhere larger while we looked for our dream home. We would use the equity money to put a deposit into the new one. She readily agreed. Our house sold very quickly and we rented another place nearby. I was a tenant on a lease that was only for six months. When we moved into rented premises, I caught a bad cold. I used this as an excuse to move into the spare room so I wouldn't have to give it to her. I just never came back after that, and she never commented. Maybe she didn't notice it, 
or maybe she just liked it. Then I asked my father, whom I also trusted, to start a new IT company, of which he became the owner. I was his only employee. I then closed my own company and started running my business through his company. Everything was going according to plan until I ran into a very nervous and scared Lauren. Lauren was dating her first boyfriend, and I immediately had deja vu and thought she was pregnant, like what happened to her mom. Um, Dad, it's hard to tell you, but Mom is having an affair with her boss. I was shocked by what she knew and was momentarily speechless. Is it true? Why do you think so? Well, right after we moved here, Emma and I went back to our old house to pick up something she forgot. Mom and her boss were there. Well, it's a little weird, but it doesn't prove anything. They had sex, Dad, on the living room floor. After I got over the shock, I said, I know about their affair, Lauren, I've known for a while. Then why don't you do something about this cheater? Did Emma see her too? Yes. I called Emma, who was hiding within earshot around the corner, and she sheepishly walked into the room. I hugged them both tightly. I knew what a terrible thing they had to see, especially young Emma. Can you both keep a very big secret? They nodded. I plan to divorce my mother soon. I'm just waiting until Emma turns 14 so you can both legally choose who you want to live with. With you, they both shouted in unison. It won't be easy to keep this secret, but until then we don't have to do anything to warn your mother. They smiled conspiratorially. After that, I asked Sophie to chat with Lauren. Now she had her first boyfriend, and I didn't want her to follow in her mother's footsteps. Luckily, Amy wasn't present that often, so we could tolerate her occasional presence and keep our secret. We enjoyed it even more when she was away, knowing the end was near. We spent more and more time with Sophie and her two children, often having lunch at each other's houses or going for walks together. One Friday afternoon, when my wife was supposedly at a conference all weekend, but was actually at the hotel with her boss, Lauren said, Dad, I'm going to look after Sophie tonight. Oh, really? What is she doing? When you go on a date with a guy to Brassiere, Paris, you know this really cool French restaurant in town. I immediately felt jealous and tried unsuccessfully not to show it. My daughter looked at me with pity. She's dating you, idiot. It's time for both of you to go on a proper date. I already booked the room, so just call her now and ask her out properly, handing me the phone. What if she doesn't want to go on a date with me? After all, we're just friends. I don't want her to feel uncomfortable. How you even managed to be smart enough to graduate from university, I don't understand. Call her now. I called and Sophie was absolutely thrilled and agreed immediately. Somehow I got the impression that this was not a surprise. It took me three tries that night before my girls were happy that I was dressed appropriately for dinner. As I was about to leave the house, Callie and Tom came in. In response to my questioning look, Lauren said, Oh, I forgot to tell you, they're spending the night here tonight, so don't worry about coming home late or at all if you will. She smiled and handed me the already packed bag. All our children were obviously involved in an organized conspiracy. When I arrived, Sophie met me at the door. She was wearing a small, tight black cocktail dress with a plunging neckline and stiletto heels. The dress fit every inch of her gorgeous, slender, athletic body perfectly. Her long black hair was loosely braided and combed to the side. Well, say something, Alan. I can't, I'm speechless. Do you like it? she said, turning around. Oh, much more, Sophie. I had the best dinner, and we had a great time in each other's company. At the end of the evening, as we approached the front door of her house, I said, I know our kids settled me in for the night, but you don't. She put her finger to my lips and said, SHHH, I'm counting on you to stay, and led me inside and up to her bedroom. I wasn't going to argue with that. At first, we were a little shy and unsure. It was the first time for both of us with someone else. While I thought she looked amazing before, seeing her naked was simply stunning. It didn't take us long to get the hang of it and really get into it. 
I let go of all my pent-up mental and sexual frustrations and truly felt like I had died and gone to heaven. By the end, I was exhausted. The next morning, we made love again and then lay in bed for some time, enjoying each other. It was a very long time for both of us, and it felt so good and so right. We heard several footsteps on the stairs, voices outside, and a knock on the bedroom door, which then opened. Lauren stuck her head inside. Good morning to you, too. It's almost ten, and we're tired of waiting, so we came. Breakfast downstairs will be ready in twenty minutes. Oh, and I wanted to ask if you had a good evening, but judging by your expressions, there's no need, she smirked. We heard laughter outside the door as they all left. How do we have such a great group of kids, Sophie? The breakfast they prepared was delicious, and it was great to get together as a family. Later at home, I tried to explain to my girls what happened between me and Sophie. After all, I technically cheated on their mother. They both just rolled their eyes and laughed at my discomfort. Dad, it's time for you to be happy again. Anyway, you are no longer married to your mother. She left you a long time ago. So what are you accomplices planning? Actually, we all agree. Emma and I need a mother, and Cassie and Tom need a father. You and Sophie are made for each other. So everyone wins. Even if I thought it was a good idea, Sophie probably didn't. Dad, seriously, you should be able to tell how she feels about you and what she wants. Can I say anything about this? No, absolutely nothing, Dad. It was clear from their appearance that they found it all very funny. Now I was truly controlled by my daughters. A few days later, over dinner with all of us, I announced that I was going to go house hunting the following weekend. Sophie asked me what place I was looking for. Well, I want it to be close to the beach, two stories, with a big family room, a kid's den, a big backyard, and a pool. It should have at least six bedrooms in case my family ever grows, who knows. Looking directly at her, I said, I also want to make sure that the woman I may have fallen head over heels in love with will like it too. Sophie stared at me for a full minute, then walked over to where I was sitting and kissed me passionately in front of the children. As we stood up to catch our breath, they watched us in silence and then burst into joy as they danced around us. I took that as a yes. After weeks of searching, we found the perfect place. We decided to buy it together. She took part of the life insurance money received from her husband as collateral, and I took the proceeds from the sale of my house. Everything was ready for a showdown with Amy. Amy announced that she was leaving for a sales conference on the West Coast for seven days. I later checked her email and discovered that she was indeed going on vacation with her boss to celebrate their third anniversary to the island of Bali in Indonesia. To avoid suspicion at work, they told everyone on their own that they were taking time off with their families because they were working so hard that they were neglecting them. She left work a day before her boss and flew alone to Bali. He will follow her in a day. She returned to work a day earlier than her boss to make this scenario seem plausible. They became lazy. Their gimmick wasn't up to their usual standard, as it could easily fall apart if anyone checked. Amy flew out to her conference, and we immediately began packing our things and moving them to our new home, which Sophie and her children had moved into the month before. Well, the Balenese god of revenge, if he exists, actually smiled at me. The same evening Amy arrived, Bali's Mount Agung erupted with full force, sending clouds of volcanic ash into the air. All flights to and from Bali were suspended with immediate effect. Her lover was still at home while Amy was stuck in Bali alone to celebrate their anniversary. It was too good to be true. I laughed so hard I almost got caught. The eruption continued and all flights remained cancelled, keeping the lovers apart. Behind the scenes, I checked her emails and messages every day for fun. The lovers were not happy, and Amy became increasingly irritable towards Dan, as if it were his fault. Amy called home from time to time and told us how busy she was at the conference. Unusually, I asked her about the hotel and asked questions about the city in which she was supposedly staying. When I later accessed her laptop remotely, 
Her history showed that she was frantically searching the internet during our phone conversation to come up with plausible answers. In the meantime, all six of us settled into our new home very well. I have instructed my lawyer to file a legal separation document with the family court. I also received temporary custody of my daughters in court after submitting their signed requests to live with me. As Amy's return date approached, all flights remained cancelled, so I wondered how Amy would handle the situation. She called me one evening and told me that she had made a lot of contacts at a conference with potential big sales and that her boss had asked her to start tracking them right away before going home. I felt that she was very nervous. It's a good thing she didn't make a video call because I wouldn't have been able to keep a straight face. I just reassured Amy that we were okay and I understood. As another week passed and she was still stuck in Bali, I saw desperate emails and messages between lovers. Her boss informed everyone at work that she had to extend her leave due to a family emergency. Her boss also called me and apologized for keeping Amy away from home for so long, but it was a big opportunity, vital for the company, and so on. I was expecting his call and was well prepared to respond like a respectable husband to an important working wife. I assured him that I was fine and understood. I then naively asked him where Amy would go next. He stuttered, trying to think of places. I read his email to Amy where he told her where she needed to be. My strategy, of course, was to make her nervous and create doubt in her mind that she had been discovered. I continued to reassure my wife on every call that I understood, but continued to ask her about attractions in the cities where she was staying. I could tell she had researched ahead of time, so I always asked her a few unexpected, tricky questions and enjoyed her attempts to master them. I was just pretending to be naive. During one call I said, Hey Amy, have you read about those poor people stuck in Bali who can't get home because of the volcano? There was a moment's pause, and then she said, Oh yeah, but I haven't been following that much in the news. One of my colleagues has been stuck there for two weeks. Do you remember Paul Howard and his wife? We met them about six months ago. Oh yes. We're working on a project together, and he's forced to do his part remotely online from his hotel in Nusa Dua. At least Grand Gayat isn't the worst place to get stuck. I heard Amy sigh on the phone. Of course, this was the hotel where she was staying. Paul hadn't even been to Bali, but she didn't know that. Immediately after the call, she moved to a cheap hotel on the other side of the island. She must have been praying that she could get out of it. Of course, my five girls and my son thought the whole charade was funny. Yes, Sophie's children were mine now. Finally, after almost three weeks, the volcanic eruptions stopped and flights from Bali resumed. Amy called me to tell me that her work was over and she would be back on Friday afternoon. I waited for her to return home from the airport in our rented and now empty house. I planned this meeting very carefully. When she came in, I was sitting at the kitchen table with two glasses and a bottle of wine. She looked tired and very nervous. Unusually for someone who had been in business for three weeks, she had a deep tan. I did not stand at the ceremony with the usual kiss on the cheek. Wow, you have a great tan from your business trip. Did you work at all? She muttered something, blushing. Sit down and have a glass of wine with me. I poured wine into my glass and took a sip. Alan, I'm exhausted. I just want to go upstairs, shower, and relax before dinner. I'm sorry, but there are things we need to talk about that can't wait, so please sit down now. The girls are staying at a friend's house for the night, so nothing will disturb us. Amy's expression showed real fear. She thought her game had finally been revealed and I was going to reprimand her. But she had no idea what would happen next. She reluctantly sat down and I poured her some wine. I practiced my speech many times and practiced my apologetic facial expression. You know, Amy, things haven't been the same between us for a long time. Do you know why? She looked scared and just croaked, no. I'm really sorry to tell you this, Amy. I can't sugarcoat it. The truth is, I met another woman. I love her and I want to be with her. So I decided to leave you to be with her. 
In an instant, shock struck her, and her frightened expression changed to silent fury. I continued to remain properly apologetic. I didn't mean for this to happen. You've just been gone so much, I guess I got lonely. How dare you do this to me, Alan? After everything I've done for you, who she is, I'm sure you've already had sex with her. I just sat there with a sad face until she told me everything for about five minutes. I can see that you are very angry, which is understandable. There is no point in continuing the conversation now. I will be back tomorrow afternoon around four to talk more. We have a lot to talk about. I put her tirade behind me and returned to my new home. A series of angry text messages and voicemails followed me. I didn't answer them. Everyone at home was eagerly waiting to see how it went. My answer, better than I expected. We had pizza for dinner and watched a movie together. The girls turned off their phones to avoid their mother, although I made it clear to them that they could not break contact with her. Why didn't I accuse her of her affair? Because it would hurt her a lot more. The next day, in the afternoon, I showed up at our old house, armed with a folder of documents. I was greeted by a still very angry Amy, along with her best friend Claire, who was a lawyer and whom I never liked. I've seen old emails where Claire encouraged Amy to stay in touch in the early stages when Amy was feeling guilty and considering ending the relationship. I sat down at the table facing them both. Claire seemed to have been appointed to speak and apparently attack was the best defense. She started going into detail about what a freak I was and what a wonderful wife and mother Amy was, how I used her while she worked so hard for the family, how I had to beg her to take me back. If I don't do this, she will ruin me in a divorce, take the girls, and I will never see them again. What hypocrites. They obviously thought that if I had known about her relationship with the boss, I would have brought it up last night. I maintained an air of sorrow, apology, and bewilderment. Amy, I know how much you're hurting, but I think it's strange that you're so angry. It's been a long time since I felt like you really loved me. You've been physically and emotionally absent from our marriage for the last three years. That's complete nonsense, Alan. Of course I was there. I know I worked hard, which took me away a lot, but I did it for us. Well, tell me, Amy, when was the last time we made love? Amy was silent. I can tell you, it was three years ago. That's not true, we had sex. Yes, we had sex very rarely, but I was talking about making love. I can pinpoint the last time. Remember, three years ago, when you were on a business trip and forgot to call Emma on her 11th birthday. She tried to call several times in the evening and couldn't. She was so upset. I remember it well because Emma's birthday was two weeks ago when you were away and you forgot to call her again. So it seemed to me that it was the anniversary of someone bad for us. She looked at me guiltily. Ever since you came home from that trip three years ago, things between us have, for some reason, never been the same. I always wondered, why is this like that? From the expressions on their faces, I knew I had hit the target. They looked very awkward and glanced sideways at each other. After all, Amy, we've been sleeping in separate bedrooms for about six months now. It doesn't seem to bother you. I can't remember the last time we went out together or took a vacation. It's almost like you're taking time off from work. They both winced. When you're home, you're not here with me and your girls. I smiled mentally as they shifted in their seats. Anyway, Amy, I'm really sorry, but I'm moving on and I hope we can make our separation as easy as possible for the sake of the girls. In reality, there is no possibility of reconciliation. Who is she? Do I know her? You've met her daughter Callie a few times. You know Emma's best friend. Her mom Sophie and I met at Saturday Night Football last year and became friends. I think our friendship grew from then until we realized we were in love. We had an affair and recently decided to move in together. Before they could say anything else, I placed a large indexed folder on the table. I have collected some documents and information for you. Tab A is the separation agreement I filed with the court two weeks ago. Tab B is the divorce petition you have to sign. The sooner you sign, the sooner we can move on. 
Tab C proposed financial settlement. Tab D is the new lease for this house. The lease expires in three weeks, so if you want to say you will have to renew it in your name. All utility contracts are there. Tab E is bank statements. I took 60% of the funds in our joint accounts. Credit cards in your name are now your responsibility. Finally, Tab F is the court order for temporary custody and child support. The girls decided to live with me, so I have custody. Child support will come directly from your paycheck at work. Access to visits has been left open to allow us to resolve this in a way that suits us. They were stunned. I was so well prepared. Claire began, Bastard, you've been planning this forever. You won't get away with this. We'll beat you down and nail your skin to the wall. We will take your at company, your daughters, and your money. Well, yep, I've been planning this since Christmas. I had an awakening moment at your staff's Christmas party, Amy. I realized that it was really over between us, and it was time to act. I saw Amy desperately trying to remember what happened there. So selling a house to buy another was bogus back then, Claire said. I just smiled. As for putting me out of business, Claire, I don't have a company. I closed it a few months ago. Now I work for someone else. I bought a new house with Sophie to live in after I filed for separation, so it's not an asset to our marriage. Since I have legal custody of the girls, I can and did use 60% of the money from the sale of the house to buy a new place. So I'm not sure what you can really do, Claire. By the way, if you check the state law, you will find that when children turn 14 they can choose who they want to live with. They chose me. You really are a scoundrel, Alan. I bet you've poisoned the girls' minds against Amy. I wouldn't do that, I'm not that angry. In any case, even if I thought I should poison them, there is no need to do so. Amy did it herself, neglecting them for the past three years. You have a lot of work. What to do with them, Amy, to get them back? It is important for their well-being that they have a good relationship with their mother. She didn't neglect them. She's a good mother. That's not how they see it, Claire. She was virtually absent from their lives for many years. Amy, ask yourself who feeds them, who takes them to sports, who packs their school lunches, who helps them with homework, who buys them clothes, who always remembers their birthdays and buys them gifts, who goes with them to movies, who do they turn to with problems, who helps them during their first period, and who gives them love and affection. I can go on. Well, Amy was very quiet. I could tell she was having a hard time processing what happened. The girls asked me to ask you if you would meet them tomorrow morning for brunch at 10 a.m. at the Beachside Cafe. It was actually my idea for them to meet you because they don't really want to see you. So, is it okay for me to tell them? She simply nodded. I left them both and returned to my family. The next day, the girls reported that Amy scolded me all the time and demanded that they move in with her. Eventually, the girls excused themselves to go to the restroom and just quietly left. What I couldn't understand was why she wanted to make peace. She hasn't taken care of me for years. Maybe I was just a convenient nanny and housekeeper. It was a real shock to me when Alan told me that he was leaving me for another woman. How could he? I thought he loved me. Despite several attempts to talk to him about reconciliation, he wanted nothing to do with me, and our only contact was when we picked up and dropped off my daughters for visits. My girls were openly hostile towards me and spending time with them was unpleasant. When I brought them home after the visit, they happily ran to their new stepmother and hugged her, deliberately to anger me. Finally, I told them not to come until they wanted to. I always imagined that my life would continue the same way, with my lover for my pleasure away from me, and with my husband taking care of me at home. The shock and emotional devastation of Alan leaving me was enormous. As the months went by, the more I thought about it, I realized that although it was a huge surprise, it shouldn't have been. Alan was right. In many ways, I was the absent wife. Over the past three years, I have focused most of my love and emotional intimacy on Dan. There was little left for him to do. I realized that the only real surprise was that he stayed so long. I couldn't afford house rent and child support, so I had to move into a tiny old apartment. I spent my nights at home alone, 
watching TV, and eating takeout. Dan's attitude also changed when Alan left me. Suddenly, he was too busy with his family to spend much time with me, even though I was now a free woman and always available. He increasingly sent me on business trips alone, saying that now I could cope with clients. When we were together, the emotional connection seemed to disappear. Basically, we just got together and had sex, and that wasn't good sex either. About six months after the end of my marriage, Dan announced that he was leaving the company to take a job at another firm in another city. I tearfully told him to never contact me again. In the blink of an eye, I became a divorced woman. I couldn't help but think of a line from Joni Mitchell's song, Don't you always seem to know what you've got till it's gone. I foolishly thought I could have my cake and eat it too. It didn't help my confidence that Alan was now with a gorgeous woman, so sweet that it was impossible to hate her. He simply glowed with happiness with his new partner. I remember he looked like this to me when we were young parents trying to raise two children. No matter what difficulties we faced, we fought together to overcome them, and we were happy and in love. How did I let this unravel? My two girls looked much happier, too. They treated Sophie as their mother, not me. I was just an annoying relic of their past that they were forced to visit from time to time. It really hurts. I think I hit rock bottom when I complained to my girls about my situation. Lauren looked at me coldly. Well, did you throw Dad away after all? I know I wasn't a perfect wife and I neglected you all a little, but he was the one who left me for another woman. Mom, he left you because you had an affair with your boss for three years. The look of horror on my face said it all. I was so ashamed. Alan knew all this, but said nothing. I really screwed up, threw away a really good husband, and lost my daughters. True to his word, Alan encouraged our girls to stay in touch with me. He was right. I have a lot of work to do to get them back. Gradually, they began to come without coercion, and sometimes even spent the night. One evening, as I dropped the girls off at their new home, I asked Alan if we could have a quick chat. He got out of the car with me. I turned and looked at him. Lauren told me that you knew about Dan and me. I'm so sorry, Alan. You were a good husband and did nothing to deserve this from me. I was just an ungrateful, selfish bitch, and I got what I deserved. He simply nodded. Why didn't you tell me what you knew, Alan? Maybe you could stop me early enough to restore our marriage. By the time I found out, it was too late. When did you find out? I caught you with your boss when you snuck off to the office Christmas party last year. I didn't show that I saw you. After that, I did some digging and found out everything. I blushed deeply. I felt so ashamed. I admit, I was quite amused when you were stuck in Bali alone. Oh God, I feel so miserable. You must hate me. Why didn't you confront me? I was very angry with you and wanted you to feel my hurt. I did some research and discovered that you are not the first secretary your boss has slept with. I decided that the best way to punish you was to simply remain silent and let things unfold. Knowing his past, I figured that if your affair was kept a secret, he would probably keep you for a while and then eventually get tired of you and leave you for someone new. I was worried that if I made a big scene, his wife might find out and divorce him. Then he will be free to be with you, and perhaps you will remain unpunished. I also thought that it would be much worse for you if you thought that I was just leaving you for another woman. I must say, your strategy worked perfectly. You definitely got your revenge, Alan. My life is terrible. I guess, looking back, I'm sorry you got hurt so badly. Well, just a little sorry, to be honest. You don't need to apologize, it was my fault. I would have left you if you had done what I did. Looking back, I was just seduced by the excitement of it all and became addicted to it. I tried to stop in the first days, but by then it was too late. I became so obsessed with him and absorbed in my desires that I simply forgot about you and my girls for a while. My anger has subsided, Amy, and I forgive you. I think I'm more philosophical now. After all, I wouldn't be with Sophie now if you hadn't cheated on me. Yeah, I know, that really hurts the most. Our marriage was difficult from the start, Sophie, 
so I don't think you're a bad person at all. Yes, you made a really big mistake, but he was a master seducer. You never had the chance to grow up normally, to do normal things that teenagers do, especially dating and finding someone you really wanted to spend the rest of your life with. You're probably right, Alan, but why did you have to tell the girls about him? It was too cruel. No wonder they hated me. I didn't tell them Amy. They told me. What how? They both unexpectedly returned to our old house and found you two having sex in the living room. Remember, right after we took our things out. At first I couldn't remember, then I remembered with horror. What did they see? Everything is fine, even Emma. Lauren described this event to me quite clearly. My whole body seemed to simply collapse beneath me, and I began to sob with all my heart, not paying attention to anything around me. I don't know how long I cried, but I felt that Alan was hugging me. He was supporting me and holding me tightly, burying my head in his chest. This familiar feeling and smell made me cry again. I was aware that they had picked me up, carried me inside, and laid me on the sofa. I felt so terrible. Everyone, including Alan's new partner Sophie, was so sweet and caring. She insisted that Isteyedto calm down, and when I came to my senses, she insisted that I stay for dinner. Sitting at the table with his new family, Alan looked so happy. I really screwed up. In the evening, approaching my car, he put both hands on my shoulders. Amy, I don't want you to keep beating yourself up so much and being unhappy. We had a really rough start in life when we were too young to be parents and committed to each other for life. When you think about it, the most amazing thing is that our marriage has lasted this long 14 years. It's a credit to both of us. Look on the positive side. Our two mistakes gave birth to two lovely daughters from whom we have raised two wonderful young women. It's a fantastic legacy of our marriage that cannot be taken away. You're right, Alan. Speaking of mistakes, I must tell you that I made another one. Sophie is pregnant, so we will get married sooner than expected. You seem to be very error-prone. You are a good man and a good husband, Alan, better than I deserved. I wish you all the best. I hugged him and kissed him on the cheek and then left. My seat was indeed taken. My only hope was that I could find another man as good as him. Great chance. Why did I forgive her so easily? A few reasons. Because hate can consume you and make you bitter. Because she was still regularly punished simply for seeing me with Sophie. I, too, once loved her and our connection, despite everything, still existed. Although I wanted to punish Amy, my real revenge was directed at her boss, Dan, who took her away from me in the first place. I also hacked his computer by sending him an email that looked like it came from Amy. It included a hidden virus that gave me full access to everything. I discovered that he had quietly and cleverly embezzled his old employer's money and was now playing the same game with his new employer. I collected a lot of evidence and sent it anonymously to both employers and the police. Faced with overwhelming evidence, he pleaded guilty at trial and was sentenced to seven years in prison. His wife supported him during the trial and later visited him in prison with their children. I went to meet her and showed her incriminating evidence of his numerous affairs. She was furious and decided to leave him on the spot. To complete my revenge, I went to visit Dan in prison. At first, he didn't recognize me. Hey Dan, we've met before, I'm Amy's ex-husband. What the fuck do you want, asshole? To convey messages to you. First from my ex-wife Amy. She sends her regards to you and hopes that you enjoy your new home, which I personally helped you furnish. What? You know you really should have hired a professional to encrypt your computer. Once I hacked it, it only took me 15 minutes to uncover everything. I just couldn't resist sending this material to the police. After he stopped yelling at me, I said, I hope you don't mind, but I also went to see your wife and took the liberty of showing her all those incriminating photos and videos I found of you and your friends. I have to say that she was very, very angry with you. She insisted that we have revenge sex in your own bed, and I couldn't refuse. I don't know why she wasn't enough for you. Bullshit. She wanted me to show you this. 
I laid out photographs in front of him of the two of us having sex in different positions. Of course, they were faked using Photoshop, but he didn't know that. She said to tell you that she will never visit you here again and that you will never see your children again. I gave her the name of my lawyer who will help her divorce your sorry ass. The look on his face was priceless. Yes, revenge is indeed a dish best served cold. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.